Magandang hapon po sa inyong lahat. Good afternoon. Welcome to our worship service uh, this afternoon. And it's really a delight to see each other every Sunday. Amen? God has called us to meet. Amen? Until He returns. So we will not stop meeting until He returns. So again, good afternoon. And this afternoon, we are going to go back to the book of Ephesians. So for those who hasn't been here for uh, some time, we are actually studying the book of Ephesians. Okay? So uh, we started it in February, March. We had a break in March. And now we're going back to this book to study chapter 2. Okay? So just a quick review of Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, we have already discussed about Apostle Paul who wrote the book of Ephesians in his missionary journey. And when he wrote the book of Ephesians, he gave a great theology of what defines us as a Christian and what defines us as a church. That's the reason why the title of our series message is, We Are the Church. church. Okay? And I've mentioned before that Ephesians is the highest form or the highest queen of the letters of Apostle Paul, you know, to, to the churches because it brings great theological uh, 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 truth, you know, about, about God. And uh, Ephesians chapter 1, if you will just remember, um, it has been uh, emphasized, you know, put into, into our hearts that we are chosen by the Father in verse 1 to 14, we are redeemed by the Son, and we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. So if you want to review that, uh, please come to me. I'll give you a message copy of it. Or you can also visit our website and hopefully it will be posted soon. Okay? And uh, we continue on Ephesians 1. And uh, it also says that he prayed for the church. That the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that we can know God more. As I said before, that is the highest calling of a Christian. Not to become a great pastor, not to become a great worship leader, not to be, be, be plenty in the church. That's not what God really called us. What God called us is to know Him deeper and deeper. That's the highest calling of our Christians. All of the things I've said are really good. Don't get me wrong. It's all good to grow, you know. But the thing is, in your life, the greatest thing is to know God. And he also prayed that the eyes of our heart will be enlightened, okay? So we may know the hope of our calling, the riches of his glory, and the inheritance of the same, and what is the power in us. So I've discussed that very deeply. So if you also need copies of it, please come to me. I can give you copies of the uh, previous uh, uh, message about Ephesians chapter 1, okay? So I hope this is embedded in your hearts. I hope you did not forget it, and the Holy Spirit will just imprint it in you that you are chosen by the Father, redeemed by the Son, and sealed with the Holy Spirit. That is your identity, okay? And that you are called for His calling, you are called for His riches, and you are called because of His power. Amen? So we are going now to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. And before anything, let's just come to the Lord and let's just offer this time and let's ask the Holy Spirit to just speak to us this afternoon. Father God, coming on, we want to say thank you for who you are. We thank you, Lord, for the great riches you have talked about, Lord. You have revealed to Apostle Paul in the book of Ephesians. And today, Lord, as we just dive into your word, Lord, I pray, Holy Spirit, you will speak, O God. You will talk to us, O Lord. You will transform us, Lord. You will, Lord, we will, we will hear you right now, O God. I pray that the scales of our eyes, spiritual scales of our eyes will be removed, O God. I pray that the ears, Lord, open our spiritual ears right now, Lord. I pray for our senses, spiritual senses, to be awakened in Jesus' name, O God. And I pray, Lord, that your word, as you said in Hebrew, it's sharper than two double-edged sword. It pierces, Lord, our hearts. It divides the bones, the body, Lord, and the soul, oh God. Lord, I pray that today your word will do that work, oh God, as it always does, Lord God. So, Father, reveal the things that you want to reveal right now, Lord, and may we absorb it in our lives today and never forget it. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. So please open your Bibles in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 1 to 10. So that's again Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. All right. Give me a thumbs up if you're there. All right. Most of you are there. That's good. So let's read. 
I'll read it from the New Living Translation. It says there, Once you were dead because of your disobedience and many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger just like everyone else. Verse 4, But God is so rich in mercy and He loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, He gave us life when He raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. Verse 6, For He raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. Verse 7, so God can put to us in all future ages of a uh, future as ages as example of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us as showed in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. Verse 8. For God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you cannot take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so that none of us can boast. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us in you in Christ Jesus, so we can do good things he planned for us long ago. Amen. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 to 10 actually talks about our spiritual journey or our spiritual growth, okay? And the verses here talks about what we are in the past, what we are in the present, and what we are in the future. This is all about our spiritual journey, our, 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 our personal experience with the Lord. And, in, and we will going to divide it into three, what we are in the past, what we are in the present, and what we are in the future. So let's go what we are in the past, and you will see it in verses 1 to 3. Verse 1 says, we were dead because of our disobedience and our many sins. Guys, I have a bad news for you. The moment you were conceived and born, you are already dead, <laughs> right? That's a bad news. When you were born, you are already dead. What do I mean? The moment you are born, you are already DOA, dead on arrival, all right? Physically, you are alive, but spiritually, you are dead. We are dead. How did it start? Pastor David gave us a very clear picture last week when Adam and Eve sinned against the Lord. Genesis 1 verse 3, God said, You must not eat the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil or even touch it. If you do, you will, what's the word? Die. And that is not a physical death, but that is what? A spiritual death. So meaning, the sin that, that, that Adam and Eve did, it made us spiritually dead already. You were alive, you were a, a, a born here on earth, but spiritually, you are dead on arrival, okay? You are dead, we are all dead on arrival. And when we talk about sin, it means to say you miss the mark. So Adam and Eve actually missed the mark of what God wants them to do. And because of that, they were separated from God. And it is scary to us from our ancestors. It was passed to us. And I love how Pastor David mentioned it last week. We are the carriers of that sin. So the sin is on us already. We are all sinners, you know? That's why little kids, when they are born and when they grow, they just grab things. It's our natural way. It's our sinful way. Nobody taught them to grab things from their friends. Nobody taught them how to lie. I did not teach my children to lie, but sometimes they do, you know? Uh, you know? <laughs> so please pray for my children. You know? <laughs> it's their sinful, natural way, okay? Nobody taught them, but it's embedded in our hearts and in their hearts as well. So we are all dead. We are all sinners. And we know that dead people have no life, you know? We have many nurses here. We have seen many kinds of dead people. And even if I shout, I scream, I punch them, you know, I pinch the dead people, they will never wake up. They will never open their eyes. If they open their eyes, you know, it's like they're creepy, all right? There's no stimulus on a dead person, all right? There is nothing. And that's why unbelief 
believers, when you say God to them, there's no stimulus. There's nothing. It doesn't even touch them. You know, it doesn't even ring a bell to them. When you shout and scream Jesus to them because they're spiritually dead, you know, there's no stimulus with them to them. It doesn't attract them. So that is who we are. We are dead. D-O-A, okay? Verse 2, it says, we are slaves of sin. We walk and live in sin. We are literally the walking dead. <laughs> you know, the series, I have not watched this. That don't, Please don't watch that, oh God. But that is the series, Walking Dead. We are literally the walking dead because we are slaves of sin. We are walking against the Lord. And who does the world of sin obey? What does verse 2 say? It is the devil, the commander of the evil one. The spirit that works in the hearts of unbelievers is the devil. Alright? And who are we again? Verse 3, we are all. We all have the desires of the sinful nature. All of us, no exemption. We follow the sinful nature. And what are the desires of the sinful nature? Galatians 6, 19 to 21. Paul says, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality. That's the reason why don't engage to premarital sex because before marriage, because sex is designed for, for married couple joined by God, you know? And, 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 and sex is designed for that. And when you marry, you only have to have one husband and one wife, okay? It, it's not acceptable. The Bible says it's not acceptable to have many, all right? Impurity, lustful pleasure, thinking in your mind, dirty thoughts, idolatry. Idolatry doesn't need to be a wooden image. Idols can be things, people, you spend time more than God, you know? It could be video games, material possession, career, money. Idolatry can be that form. What else? What, what, what else the Bible says? Sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension or rebellion, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like this. Let me tell you, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's very clear, these are all the ways of the sinful nature. And Apostle Paul says, all of us, all right? Not because you're a pastor, you know, uh, you, you, you're perfect, all right? All of us have sinned. Nobody on earth has ever been perfect. And this is who we are in the past. We are spiritually dead. We are walking in our sinful nature. We, are, we follow the desires of the sinful nature. And we are all doomed to hell. That is the bad news. Poor thing. How poor thing we are. How wretched and miserable we are. How hopeless we are. Without God, we are hopeless, separated. How pitiful we are. How poor we are. But take note. Verse 4. But God. Amen? Look at verse 4. But God. But God. But God is so rich in mercy and love that even though we were dead of our sins, He gave us life when He raised Christ from the dead. And it's only by God's grace that you have been saved. I don't know of you, my friends, but I love these two words. But God. Everybody say, but God. Come on, let's say it. But God. With all the sinfulness we have, God shows up and does something in order for a wretched, miserable, poor, sinful people like you and me, he did something but God. If it was not for God, we are still dead to our sins. That is why we need to be born again. From death, we are spiritually dead, but God, we need to be born again. What is being a born again? We, we know John 3, 5 to 7, when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, Nicodemus asked, does it mean that, you know, when you're old, you will be brought back to your mother's womb? 
What did that Jesus say? I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom without being born of water and spirit. Human can produce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives to spiritual life. So don't be surprised. What did Jesus say? You must be born again. You must be born again. And it is the Holy Spirit that makes our dead spiritual state alive. And this is only done through Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Romans 10, 9, If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Your belief, your love for God, your trust in the Lord with all your heart, that's what makes you saved. And it's only by the work of the Holy Spirit. Not our work, but His work. And this is salvation. We are saved from our spiritual death. Now we are alive in Christ. This is being born again. But it takes two words. But God. Aren't you happy with those two words? But God. Two words. Three letters in two words. Very, very powerful words. You know, Martin Lloyd-Jones, one great theologian said, this two words, but God, is the whole summary of the Bible. It is the whole summary of the Bible. It is just but God. It is only by God that you and I are saved. Only by God, but God. But question, why did God have to do this? Why is he interested in saving you and me? And the answer is also found in that verse because he is so rich in mercy and love. That is his quality, my friends. That is his characteristics. That is who he is. You cannot take that out from God. He is just merciful. He is just loving. You cannot change that from our God. Amen. 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 Last, last Saturday in our Bible study, we talked about the characteristics of God. And I really enjoyed discussing it because one characteristic of God is love. And you cannot change that. He is love. Amen. Why did God want to save us? Because He just loves us. He's just so rich in mercy. Lamentations 3, 22 to 23. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. No ending. His mercies never cease. Great is His faithfulness. His mercies are fresh every morning. Do you need His love? It's never ending. Never ending. It's always there. Question, when did God start to love you? When did God start to love us? Did He love us when we are lovable? Did we love us when we are perfect? No. He said this. He started loving us when we were dead because of our sin. That even though, verse 5, even though you were dead because of our sin, He gave us life when He raised Christ from the dead. It is only by grace that you have been saved. Friends, He loved you when you hated Him most. He loved you when you refused Him. He loved you when you did not like Him. He loved you when you, you ran away from Him. He loves you when you don't think about Him. He loved you whatever situation you are at the moment. And now that we receive His love, we are born again. Now that we are alive spiritually, now that our dead bodies and dead spirits are awakened, we don't stop there. Amen? Because we receive the love of God. He loved us when we were dead from our sins. But now that we are born again, now that we know the Lord, now that we have acknowledged the Lord in our lives, this will not stop in that point. This will not stop in accepting Him only as our Lord and Savior. This is just the beginning. Amen? This is just the beginning of our spiritual life. Aren't you so happy that you have known God? Come on, think about it. Aren't you so blessed that God showed up to your life? But God, He deserves all our praise. Amen? And now what we are in the present. Let's continue on. 
For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. There are three wonderful things that God did for us. As I said a while ago, he made us born again. He, we, we, we read it in verse 4 and 5. He raised us now from the dead and seated us in the heavens. This is our present condition right now. He made us alive again. He raised us from the dead and seated us with him in heaven. That is our present condition. That is who you are and I right now. Amen. Aren't you excited and glad that we are now born again? We are now raised from the dead and we are now seated with him in heaven. You know, um, this is all because with Christ or in Christ. Paul always emphasized this. With Christ, in Christ. He said it multiple, multiple times. We cannot do this without Christ. It's only with and in Christ. You know, when Apostle Paul says he raised us from the dead, it means to say it speaks of our spiritual resurrection. We have now a new and powerful life and position. And it demands a new set of values. It demands a new thinking. That's why we leave our old sinful nature and walk now in righteousness. That should be our present growing position in the Lord. Amen? Once you have received the Lord for salvation, your next step is to grow. Your next step is to have a new set of values. Colossians 3, 1 says, Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above. Things that are seated on the right hand of God. That is raised from the dead. And when Paul, Apostle Paul said, We are seated with Him in the heavenly places, it means our spiritual position. Our spiritual position now is in heaven. You are not going to hell anymore. You are going to heaven. You are seated. It means to say that's your, your spiritual position. This is not a literal translation that you're seated already in heaven, you know, because I can see you, you're alive, you're breathing, you have your neighbor seated beside you, your friend, your church, you're still here on earth, okay guys? But one day, it will be a literal translation sitting with Jesus in heaven, meaning we will be with him for eternity. And Paul speaks of it as if it was already happening, you know? Paul was saying it's a done deal. You are going to heaven. If you have Jesus in your heart, it's a done deal. You will have a position in heaven. And that should excite us as a Christian. Amen? That should excite you and me that we have a position in heaven. Being forgiven, being born again is just the start. And our spiritual position right now is that we can rest in the finished work of Christ in his salvation. And that's what we should be so excited about. Yes. Titus 2, 12 to 14 says, And we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasure. We should live in this evil world with wisdom. Listen to this. We should live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God while looking forward with hope to that wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus will be revealed. Titus was instructing us while you're living on earth, live with wisdom. Turn your godlessness away. Live in righteousness and devotions to God. And right now, we are looking forward for the coming of Jesus. Our thinking now is that things are in heaven. And this should be the normal Christian growth. Amen? This should be our normal Christian growth. We are being transformed where our focus now is not on ourselves, but our focus now is on Jesus in heaven. Amen? Suddenly, you tell yourself, God, I'm homesick. I want to be with you in heaven. Suddenly you say, Lord, I want to be with you forever. And this should really excite us as a Christian, as a, girl, a follower of Jesus Christ. My question, are you excited about these things? Are you excited to be with Jesus for eternity forever? That is your position right now. Amen? 
And lastly, this is what Apostle Paul said, what are we in the future, verse 7, so God can point to us in all future ages as the, oh, sorry, as example of the incredible wealth of His grace and kindness towards us, as shown in all He has done for us who are united with Christ. Paul is now pointing to the future. The word future ages, in all future ages here, it can be 100 years, can be 50 years, 1,000 years, we don't know. But now that we are positioned in Christ, we are seated with Him in heaven, it's a done deal, then that will eventually happen. That is what Paul is saying here. This will happen in the future ages. Now, can we imagine what eternity looks like? Last uh, Bible study, we have already discussed this. God is eternal. And eternity is a different realm. There's no time in eternity. We cannot say eternity will really be, you know, there's a set time. There's no 24 hours and 7 days a week in eternity. It's The time is not measured there. It's, it's forever. I cannot even imagine what eternity looks like, you know. But that is where we're going to be. Eternity. Amen. And these things, God will unfold His love to us in eternity. You know what Paul is saying here? In the future, God will still show His love for you. In the future, when you're in heaven, God will still reveal His love for you. It does not stop here on earth. His love will be revealed in heaven for you and me. Can you imagine that? His love will never stop for us for eternity. It just shows that in this verse, God will continue to show His incredible wealth of love and kindness. I cannot imagine how good God is. Because He's still thinking about us in the future. Have you ever thought that? God is thinking about you and me in the future. And His thoughts about you is not just stopping here on earth. His thoughts about you is until eternity, until you are seated with Him in heaven. And in heaven, He will still reveal His kindness to you. Can you ever imagine how good and gracious this love of God is? You know what pastor said this, God loves you so much that it will take all eternity to fully reveal His love for you. It will take all eternity to tell you that He really loves you. And we must take note of this, that we, that we are not excited for the event to go to heaven, but we are excited to meet Jesus in heaven. Amen? This is what we should be looking forward. We're going to meet Jesus in heaven. Amen? Who's excited here? I'm very excited with the future that God is in story for all Christians. And Paul emphasized in these verses, in the last few verses, that these are all spiritual blessings we receive by His grace. He said here, For God saved you by His grace when you believe and you cannot take credit for it. It is a gift of God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done so that no one can boast. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ so we can do the good things He had planned for us long ago. If there is a Bible verse, one of the Bible verses I want you to memorize, it's Ephesians 2, 8 verse 10, 8 to 10, because you are only saved by the grace of God. Can you take, say it to yourself? I am saved by the grace of God. Tell it to yourself. And he can never boast about it. This is undeserved kindness. Last week, Pastor Terrence mentioned two words, undeserved privilege. We don't deserve this, but still, God did it for us. To wrap this up from our spiritual state, what we are now in Christ, He made us alive. He raised us from the dead. He seated us in the heavenly places. Now we can look forward to eternity with Him. This is who we are from the past, from to the present, and then to the future. Have you imagined your journey with God like this? It is exciting. It is real. It's not just a joke. It is not a made-up story. It is something that we will look forward to in our Christian journey. 
Who's excited? Because I am really, really excited about this. But take note, while we are on earth, we are not perfect and we will never be perfect. We got to remember the last verse, for we are God's mastership or masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ so we can do the good things he has planned for us long ago. Other translation says we are God's handiwork, we are his workmanship. It's like a sculpture making a beautiful object of a stone. It's a masterpiece. And God is our great sculpture. We are his masterpiece. But sometimes we don't feel like we are God's masterpiece because we're still living in this imperfect world. It can take a while to live in that title. But remember, the sculpture carves and makes fine details of his masterpiece to make it beautiful and same with us. God carves out the imperfections and transforms us to be the person you want to be. And sometimes it's painful. Sometimes when God reveals some character or attitudes that you need to really say sorry, sometimes it hurts. You know, it's, her, it's, it, it's so painful to say sorry when you did something wrong to your husband or wife. Amen? It hurts. But you know what? God guards you to be humble in that situation. It's very painful to acknowledge that you made a mistake to your children. But God guards you to be humble, to be patient to your children. You know, sometimes it's hard to say forgive, to give forgiveness to your family members or co-workers that have wronged you. But God curves you to be the way he wants you to be. To be humble, to be humble in all ways. And in the end, he will make it beautiful. He will make you beautiful. So while you are on earth, while we are on earth, let's ask Lord, the Lord, Lord, transform me to make, to make me a beautiful masterpiece. Amen? As I close, and the reason why God saved us again, so that God can use us for good work. He has a purpose for you and I. He wants to use you. You don't need to be a high-level person just to be used by God. He uses the weak, the foolish, the fraud, the severely imperfect people that we have seen in the Bible. But you are saved not by good works. You are saved for good works. The reason why God wants to save you is that He wants you to be used in His service. Magpagamit po tayo sa Lord. I just have to translate it in Tagalog. Magpagamit po tayo sa Panginoon. Let us be used for His service. We should just not sit there, but let us allow God. Lord, where do you want me to be used while I I am here on earth? Amen? That is who we are right now as a Christian. You know, I heard a, a pastor said this, if a doctor can operate a person using a pocket knife in a jungle, he is a great doctor. You know, a pocket knife? And then you will do a, a lock appendix, you know, take it off just with a knife. Oh, he's so sterile, you know? No arm. That's a nurse there. It's a no arm nurse. But if he can do that in a jungle, he is a great doctor. If a builder, like Guya Russell, can build a home, you know, or a mansion using hammer and a nail. No drill. Right? No, 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 nothing. Just a hammer and a nail. Then he, will, he is a very great builder, you know? Um, he's a great builder if you're just having a hammer and a nail. If a musician can play music of Beethoven using a flute made of bamboo, you know? You know a flute? You know, you just chop the flute and then there's a beautiful music. You are a great physician, all right? If God can change this world using a dead people like you and me and make alive and save, that is a great God. Amen? Again, if God can change the world using dead people who are saved and made alive by God, He is a great God. Amen? Amen. And as I end, we really have a great God. He saved us, positioned us eternally in heaven, while we are on earth to do his good work. And that should be our Christian journey. Amen? 
So now when you read Ephesians 2 verse 1 to 10, you're going to have a new perspective of who you are in Christ. Amen? Who are you in the past? Who are you in the present? And what will you be in the future? Amen? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Who's excited with our Christian journey? Come on. Who is excited loving the Lord every day? Reading His Word. That's the reason why you open your Bible every single day. Don't miss out talking to Him because this is where you will grow. Amen? Next week, we will continue on Ephesians 2, 11 to 22. And that's very exciting because when Paul said this personally, that's personally Ephesians 1, uh, Ephesians 2, 1 to 10, in Ephesians 11 to 22, he talked about the church and what is our position as a church now. And that's going to be exciting as well for next Sunday. Who's learning in the book of Ephesians? Come on. Who's learning in the book of Ephesians? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So in that, we will close. And I pray that you will take this message at home. Can we all stand? And can we just thank the Lord for His goodness? Thank the Lord because He saved us. Thank the Lord because we were dead. When we were born, we are already dead. But there were two words in verse 4. But God. But God is so rich in His love and kindness that He, he, he purchased our freedom by the blood of His Son. He showed us His great and great mercy and love. Just begin to thank the Lord. Just begin to thank God. Just begin to thank Him for His amazing grace. Just thank Him for who He is. Thank Him. Thank Him right now with your words. Thank Him. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, we bless you, Lord. Bless you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for revealing yourself to us, Lord. Thank you for loving us, O God. Thank you for your great plan for our lives, Lord. Lord, you're not leaving us hanging, Lord. But Lord, you have promised a great future. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, even as the song is uh, playing at the moment, and the, the song is Amazing Grace, written by John Newton, Lord, it says in the song, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a rich man like me. John Newton knew, Lord, that he is nothing. He's a wretched man. It came from a personal experience. And right now, Lord, it comes from our personal experience too, Lord, that we are nothing, that we are sinners, that we, 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 have, we don't have hope, oh God, without you, Lord. But Lord, it says in the chorus of the song, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now has found. Was blind, but now I see. And it's only because of you, Lord. We cannot take credit for it, Lord. Wala po kaming pagyayabang, Panginoon. It's only because of you, Lord. And we just want to say thank you. Lord, today I pray for each and every one, Lord. I pray for our spiritual journey. Lord, I pray that you will put fire, Lord, in the hearts of every individual that is in this place, oh God. Lord, make it burning. Make it exciting, Lord God. Make it enriching, oh God. Make it so, Lord, longing, Lord, to be with you, oh God. May we look forward, Lord, to your coming, oh Lord. May we fix our on you, Lord God. Lord, if we have not fixed our eyes on you for a very long time, Lord, would you take our eyes off that thing, of that person, of that career, of that money, Lord, of that investment, or whatever things, Lord, that our eyes are focused right now. Take it away, oh Lord, and let us focus on you again and again and again, Lord. Lord, I thank you because it is your work, Lord, that will make us grow. It is your work that will fulfill your purpose in our lives, oh God. And it is you that will make our spiritual life grow deeper and deeper. Oh Lord, would you just help us until the very end, Lord? Would you give us strength until the very end, Lord? Because we want to be with you for eternity. Oh God, thank you for your word. 
Thank you for your word. Thank you for your word, Lord. The power of your word that could change our lives. Lord, I trust you. I, we entrust everything to you, Lord. And Lord, as we end our service, Lord, we pray that you will just keep us. Bless us, Lord, this week. Whatever prayers we have for ourselves and our families, Lord, we thank you that you are in control, oh Lord. And I pray for the peace of God that transcends all understanding. Guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus alone. Thank you for the victory, Lord, that you are giving to us right now, Lord. And we bless your holy and most precious name in Jesus.